Two Red River rivalry games this weekend. Texas suffers a tough loss at the Cotton Bowl. Volleyball gets their win in their game, and we take a look at the annual Texas fight rally. All this and more coming up on College Press Box. Welcome to College Press Box. I'm your host, Bailey Wall, joined by Henry Corwin. It was a crazy weekend for Longhorn sports, especially against the Oklahoma Sooners. The Longhorn football team traveled to Dallas to play in the 119th Red River, Red River Shootout. The 11th ranked Texas faced the 6th ranked Oklahoma Sooners at the Cotton Bowl Stadium on what was supposed to be the coldest day of football season, but left Longhorn fans sunburnt. It certainly did, Bailey. Texas traveled to Dallas this weekend to take on Oklahoma in the classic. Red River Showdown, the 114th one to be exact, not counting last year's Big 12 championship game. It was a game full of anticipation and, anticipation and excitement, excuse me, so let's head down to the Cotton Bowl Stadium for the highlights. We're going to start off in the first quarter. Jalen Hurts hands it off to number 26, Kenny Brooks, for the nice game there. Brooks finished with 105 rushing yards on the game. Later on in the first drive, Hurts finds C.D. Lamb for the touchdown. To start off the game on the first possession, Lamb had a huge game for Oklahoma. Later on in the quarter, Hertz takes off and runs for a huge gain, a first down and more, but the ball comes loose at the end of the run inside the 15. It is a fumble recovered by Texas. In two in possession, Edgar finds number nine, Colin Johnson, perhaps his favorite target for the game. Johnson had six or seven for 82 yards on the game. As we move into the second quarter, Hurts with the play action that will fool even the cameraman and he'll scramble off to the right under pressure, throws off his back foot and it is intercepted by Brendan Jones in the end zone. Rare pick there by Hurts as Jones able to anticipate the throw and leave his receiver to grab it. Right before the half, Cameron Dicker is not phased by Oklahoma's three timeouts and he nails the 49-yard field goal to make the score 10-3 going into the half. In the third quarter now, Ellinger hands the ball off to number two, Roshan Johnson, for a 57-yard gain. Texas really tried to establish the run, and they do so this, this play. On the next play, Sam hands the ball off to Johnson again, and he fights his way in for the touchdown, and with the extra point, the game is tied at 10. But on the next possession, the play of the game right here, Hurts hands it off to Brooks, but it's a flea flicker, and Hurts finds a wide open C.D. Lamb, who avoids not one, not two, not three, not four, but five Texas defenders to score the touchdown to put the Sooners back up. In the fourth quarter now, Ellinger is able to find the end zone with the rushing touchdown. He actually rushed for two touchdowns on this game, but it would not be enough for the Horns as the Sooners, a touchdown better than Texas on Saturday, and they win 34-27. to Turner Barnes is at the Cotton Bowl to bring us more from this game. Two teams whose hate runs deeper than the Red River itself meet in the middle for one of the most spectacular environments in college football. Number six, Oklahoma. Number 11, Texas. The winner gains a leg up in the race for the Big 12 and more importantly, a year long claim to superiority. Every year, Texas and OU fans are split down the middle at the Cotton Bowl here in Dallas. But this year, the game wasn't as even. Texas had nine more offensive plays and gained 200 less yards than Oklahoma. In the 34 to 27 Oklahoma victory, the Sooner defense was constantly in the Longhorn backfield, sacking junior quarterback Sam Ellinger a career high nine times. Ellinger gave credit to Oklahoma, but also said the Texas offense left much to be desired. What makes us hurt the most is that it was, we, we didn't play our best. We had opportunities to make plays and didn't make them. And, and then we shot ourselves in the foot at times and, and you play uh, a team that is as good as they are and you can't do that. A beat up Texas defense did all they could to slow down transfer quarterback Jalen Hurts. In the first half, Oklahoma scored only 10 points thanks to a Deshaun Jamison fumble recovery and a Brandon Jones interception in the end zone. But mediocre tackling by Texas led to big play scores by Oklahoma in the second half. The Sooners finished with 276 rushing yards, a stat sophomore linebacker Joseph Osai wasn't happy about. We'll, we'll, we'll fix it. 
While the Longhorns walked back to the locker room, the Sooners celebrated at midfield. The sight of Jalen Hurts donning the golden hat stung for the Longhorns. But Texas coach Tom Herman is determined not to let this loss derail his team's season. Obviously, this one hurts, but uh, we, we also know that uh, we can't let uh, that team beat us twice. Uh, we've got a long season ahead of us, um, and we've got to come to work tomorrow ready to learn from our mistakes, uh, accept the feedback, um, and, and get better. From Dallas, Texas, Turner Barnes, TSTV Sports. We now welcome in our football analysts, Matt Marinchak and Robert Trumino. Thanks for joining us on the show, guys. As we saw on Saturday, Texas struggled big time on the field. It was a fairly close game at the start, but the final score was 34 to 27. So what, did te what went wrong and what did Texas need to secure this win? So the defense played really well the first few drives, first and fourth and two turnovers, but the offense was able to capitalize off of them, and they just struggled tackling the whole game. There are many plays where C.D. Lamb could have been tackled, and he eluded maybe five or six defenders on that one flea flicker. They just need to re learn how to wrap up their guys, and even with Jalen Hurts, they know he was a mobile quarterback. They knew they struggled with Oklahoma State quarterback. But the middle was wide open every play. You would think after five or six times they put a QB spot to stop him, but that wasn't the case. They kept playing and run all over for 131 yards. Yeah, those are some great points made. I think <clears throat> Hurts being on offense uh, when, when he was out there, he was really the big game changer for Oklahoma. I think that the defense was the standout side for Texas in this game. That's not saying much. And you take away those takeaways that you mentioned early in the game. You, as you said, you, they let C.D. Lamb have everything he wanted. Hertz ran, ran around. Uh, the overlook I thought was Kennedy Brooks having a huge game. He wasn't their leading rusher. That went to Hertz, but he averaged 10 and a half yards a carry. Gave OU that run, run, pass option, the RPO, because Hertz could take off. Brooks could take off. You could see there, Longhorn defense allowing 511 total yards. And the fact is, is that OU's offense played pretty sloppy and missed those opportunities early. The Texas was lucky it was even this close early in the first half. All right, so now that we've covered the defensive side, what if, let's move to the offense. Ellinger was sacked nine times through no touchdowns. Super sloppy game. What was the problem there? So you have to think about the offensive line. They gave up nine sacks on Sam, and straight up, he just didn't have enough time to throw the ball down to his receivers. His receivers, when they were open, would go drop passes. Malcolm Epps dropped a few. Colin Johnson dropped an easy slant route. And those are both catchable balls. You could... Those are the kind of catches you need to make to make like to be a possible playoff contender. And if you can't make those, like what are you? Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, Sam Ellinger seemed to be let down by basically every facet of his mm -hmm. of his team. Was that he started very uh, far back in field position, and that's why you see there a hundred rushing yards, uh, all of their touchdowns coming on the ground, and those nine sacks tied for the record. Uh, that Texas has ever allowed. You have to go back to Nebraska in 2009 and Miami in 91 to get those kind of numbers. The receivers dropping the ball, um, they couldn't get the ball moving at all, frankly. Mm -hmm. And Kenneth Murray had Sam Ellinger's number all day. Alex Grinch really did this for Oklahoma. He's finally come in and put in that culture of winning, that culture of defense. And that's the, bit, that's the thing that's been holding the Sooners back for mm -hmm. years from winning national championships. I think now we're going to start to see them as a legitimate contender because this defense was plain and simple faster than OU's offense. So this week Texas is playing Kansas at home and then they're going to Fort Worth to face TCU. So looking ahead, what needs to change? Is it with the play calling? Is it the coaching? Is it their receivers? And what do you think the future is for this Texas team? It has to be, I'm going to say the play calling because if you look at it, there are so many plays, all those screen passes. They ran it a few times, failed early, but they continued to run the same play that would keep laying them down, and you'd think they would stop doing that, but they kept doing it. They kept trying to push the outside edge, even in the run game with Sam, and Sam had, I think, 23 carries for negative yards. That's not something you could keep doing, and they just need to call more deep shots, less conservative play calling, and yeah, basically that. Now, some people would say the play calling. I actually think it's all about a matter of execution. I think Texas, they did need to run less mm -hmm. of those screen plays, but that was because their wide receivers weren't getting off the line and getting those blocks good mm -hmm. on those corners. And so that's when you need to change it up. I think they need to fix a lot of the defensive issues of controlling the big playmakers. So limit and CD Lamb, make Oklahoma beat you with somebody else besides CD 
and the guy everybody knows that the ball is going to go to. And recapping going forward, Texas is playing from the shadows again with two losses. They need serious help for a playoff spot. They need to win out, plain and simple. And Ellinger, uh, he's a Heisman contender in our hearts, uh, maybe in my heart, but he needs to play record-level football, hope that every other team that has a contention, that's in contention for the playoff loses, uh, just for him to be in the conversation. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks so much for joining us tonight, guys. When we come back, we'll be talking about another Red River rivalry game between Texas and OU, but this time on the volleyball court. We'll be right back. Welcome back to College Press Box. Let's focus on another rivalry that took place closer to home this weekend. After the football team already lost, the number four Longhorns faced the Oklahoma Sooners for the first time this season on the court. Claire Hahn serving it to the Sooners, and once they pass it back, Mikaya White with the dig. Jenna Gabriel sets it up, and Logal Eggleston with the tip to get it over the net, and a point for the Longhorns. The next play, Sydney Peterson with the pass to Jenna Gabriel, and Asia O'Neill hits it over for the kill. Now we're going to move on to the second set. Receiving our Longhorns, and Jenna Gabriel, or Claire Hahn with the dig, Jenna Gabriel with the set, but the suit. Joining me now is the wonderful Nick Kuholtz. Nick, thanks so much for being here. So at least Texas fans did have one victory over OU this weekend to be happy about. Texas women's volleyball beat the Sooners in a sweep, remaining undefeated in Big 12 play. Nick, what players had standout performances this weekend? Henry, three of them stuck out to me specifically. First was Logan Eggleston, the sophomore. It was her second double-double of the week. Uh, she had 12 kills, which was almost a third of the team's total. She also had a digs and added on two aces as well. Breon Butler, I thought, also had a really good game. Henry, 10 kills, a team high, 471 hitting percentage, and also three blocks. But my favorite player on this team to watch right now also had another great game on Saturday. was Gen Saturday, Jenna Gabriel, 34 assists, six digs, set her career high with four aces. These three girls play a huge role on Jared Elliott's team. They rely on them a lot. All three of them are seniors. For a game that I thought the team overall didn't play that well, these three individual performances I thought were really impressive. Yeah, that's, an abs that's a great point, Jake. It's really, I called you Jake. Nick, I'm sorry. No it's, worries. It's a great point, Nick. It's really interesting how these teams, you know, they have a really young, young core, and that can hopefully right. uh, be able, they'll be able to build off that as years to come. Now, despite the win, Coach Jared Elliott voices displeasure with some inconsistencies he saw in the team's play, specifically in the second and third sets. Nick, is this an overreaction or are there truly areas that Texas needs to work on? I don't think it was an overreaction in any way. I thought overall the match was actually kind of misleading. I thought it was a lot closer than what the scoreboard might have suggested. Even though it was a 3-0 sweep, there were 17 ties or lead changes in this match. Now, Texas, at the end of the day, they did what they needed to do. They got the W. They're 5-0 in conference play. But it was far from their best performance. They had 12 errors and only hit 287 as a team. Not really impressive much overall as a whole team effort. Not often do you complain after a sweep, especially over your arch rival. But overall, I was not impressed with the overall team performance. Yeah, definitely. Uh, some of those areas, like, like you said, uh, Nick, is really something that they kind of have to work on if they're really going to be a championship level team. Speaking of that, with the win, Texas is now ranked number four in the nation with an 11-2 overall record. While Texas has had big wins against teams like Minnesota and BYU, some skeptics believe that Texas has still had an overall weak schedule thus far this season. 
So Nick, is their ranking of number four deserved, and is this team championship material? Well, just off their overall record, I do think it's I do think they deserve the number four spot. I think it's a fair ranking. As you mentioned, Henry, they are eleven and two overall. They have two top ten wins over Minnesota and BYU. They barely lost to Stanford on the road in five cents, the number two team in the country. Also, their only other loss was Rice, who at the time it looked like a bad loss in five sets. They're now 16-1, and one, ranked 19 in the nation. They're a lot better than a lot of people thought. I think Texas does deserve this number four ranking just off the wins and losses. Now, are they actually the fourth best team in the country? Are they, national are they a national championship caliber team? I can't say yes to that with a ton of confidence right now, but we're going to have a better answer to that when undefeated and number one ranked Baylor comes into Gregory Gym in a week and a half. If Texas wins that one, I think it's totally unfair to say that they're not capable of winning the whole thing. It's going to be a huge one, not only for the race for the Big 12 championship, but also the overall seeding in the NCAA tournament. Well, Nick, certainly that Baylor game will definitely be highly anticipated. It will be Wednesday, October 23rd, so Texas fans, mark your calendars. Well, Nick, thanks so much for your insight. Really thanks for having me, Henry. Being here. When we come back, we'll hear from Jake Herman in this week's edition of Unhooked. You don't want to miss it. Welcome back to College Press Box. I'm Henry Corwin, joined alongside Bailey Wall. Even though we've already broken down this year's Red River Showdown earlier in the show, we can never get enough football here in Texas. But instead of college or even pro football, let's hear about some high school football from our very German in this week's edition of Unhooked. Thanks, Henry. Early, earlier in the show tonight, we talked a lot about the Texas OU Red River Showdown, but for tonight's Unhooked segment, Let's see what happened in the second biggest football rivalry game played in Texas this weekend. I'm talking about the Battle of the Lakes, a local high school football rivalry between two powerhouse programs, Westlake and Lake Travis. These two schools have dominated Central Texas high school football in recent memory, and this year is no exception. Each team entered Friday night's game undefeated in different play, with both teams expected to qualify for the playoffs without much of a real threat. This was a tough ticket to get on Friday night. They were going for $100 on some secondary market websites such as Craigslist. So if you didn't catch this game, there's no need to worry because it's time now for us to check out the highlights. For a while, this series wasn't too much of a rivalry. Lake Travis won 10 times in a row from 2007 to 2016. But Westlake is in the last two meetings between these teams. So let's see what happened Friday night. Early on, it looked as if Westlake was headed for another win. They took a 10 to three lead early on in the first half after the defense forced some turnovers. It's a very stingy Westlake defense. But Lake Travis offense, they're pretty good too. Their quarterback Hudson Card is committed to play at the University of Texas. Right there he finds Kyle Eaves for a 30 yard touchdown strike. Third quarter, Westlake up 17-10. The Lake Travis defense makes a few plays to change the course of this game. Westlake will recover that fumble, but that'll set up a first down from inside of their own five yard line. Senior quarterback Kirkland Michaud drops back and he's got no chance on that play. Lake Travis forces a safety to make the score 17 to 12 and that gives the Cavaliers a little bit of momentum. Ensuing drive, Hudson Card is going to find Grayson Sandlin to convert a key third down conversion. Lake Travis rolling a little bit offensively, getting some momentum. And then Card, play fake, gets the safeties to bite and he drops it in over the top. That's Kyle Eaves, his second 30 yard touchdown of the game and Lake Travis has their first lead late in the third quarter. But skipping ahead to the fourth quarter, Westlake was not done. So sophomore quarterback Cade Klubnik is going to find the senior receiver Jackson Coker. That's his first touchdown of the year. And what a time for that because Westlake is back in front 25-19. But Lake Travis from 11 yards out is going to get the last laugh as Card puts a beautiful back shoulder fade into the end zone. That's Grayson Sandlin again, the senior wide receiver, catching the touchdown and putting Lake Travis ahead for good. There's another angle on that throw from Card. He'll be playing his football at UT starting next fall, and he gives Lake Travis a win over their rival Westlake, 26-25. to Carl isn't the only player from Lake Travis and Westlake to play their collegiate careers at the University of Texas. There are three current players from each high school that are on the UT football team. Most notably, Sam Ellinger and his brother Jake have played at Westlake in the past. Dicker the kicker and tight end Corey Brewer played at Lake Travis. There's there's a lot of past players, too, from those high schools that have had successful careers at UT. Justin Tucker, Brecken Hager, and Garrett Gilbert, just to name a few. 
So each of these teams are likely to make the playoffs and contend for a state championship. Lake Travis has won six state championships in all, and all of them came since 2007, their most recent win coming in 2016. As for the Westlake Chaparrales, they've appeared in four state championships since 2000, but they've come up short in all of them. Their last win came in 1996, when their quarterback was someone you may have heard of by the name of Drew Brees. So these two teams will be fun to watch going forward. We'll be sure to give you an update on how their seasons end up. Back to you, Henry. Thanks, Jake. When we come back, we'll hear Tom Herman's reaction to the loss this A week. lot of things that um, uh, we can learn from that game and, and need to improve on. Welcome back to College Press Box. Thursday night, we sent students out to West Campus to talk to UT students about the big game. We are here in West Campus Thursday night before the Red River rivalry. Thomas Fish, Henry Corwin, Jaxie Pigeon. We're just going to be asking students what they think about the game and maybe try to trick them up in the process. The Texas OU game, what are your thoughts? Who wins, Texas or OU? Dude, for, for real, Texas. For real. For real, Texas. What do you think about no Shane Bouchelle being the starting quarterback for the game? You think he has a chance? Possibly. We'll see. So, what do you think about the fact that Shane Bouchelle is coming back to Texas to replace Sam as the quarterback? Uh, <laughs> Why is it bad? Because he doesn't know how the team works. Do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was anything but awkward. Guys, who do you think is going to win this weekend? Texas or OU? Yes. Who wins, Texas or OU? Texas. Oh yeah. Why Texas though? Because he goes there. That's a good answer. Sam no. Sam Allen Sam Allinger is a gamer. He'll 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 you know just win it. Okay, so this is some breaking news. I don't know if we can break this news, but we're just gonna go ahead and do it. Tom Herman is sick. They're gonna bring in Matthew McConaughey to coach. How do you think he's gonna motivate this team? He does it every single weekend. The same he's been doing the whole time. He's gonna rally him up. He's somebody that they respect. He's on the field. He sees the game with his own eyes. He's just going to bring it to him. When's the Texas OU Wait, game this weekend? Obviously, Texas. I'm a government major, and I declare that like Texas wins. So and who's your favorite player on the team? Dude, I'm going to be honest. I ain't, I ain't that into football. This is a pretty cool storyline. They just announced it this week. But Colin Johnson's stepbrothers with Sam Ellinger, do you think that's why they're so good, have such good chemistry? Oh, for sure. Like, it's like the brotherly instinct, yeah. Colin Johnson and Sam Ellinger, as we know, are brothers. Do you think that they have stepbrothers, I should say? Do you think they have Step a chemistry? They're stepbrothers. Yeah, stepbrothers. Do you think <laughs> they, have, they have a chemistry because of that bond? Are they maternal or paternal? Paternal. Paternal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I miss Mac Brown. We have, we have a good boy here. Oh, Give us your predictions, <laughs> Texas or Oklahoma. Texas. He says Texas. <laughs> All right, say nothing if you think OU sucks. <laughs> you heard it here. Sucks. OU uh, sucks. Uh, who's going to win this weekend? Texas! Why? Because OU sucks. OU sucks. Just like your thoughts on the weekend? Your thoughts on the game this weekend? Thoughts on the game? <laughs> you, that's what. We're going to yeah. win! Yeah. Woo! Yeah. OU. What are your thoughts strictly on OU? OU as a university. Who thinks going to win this weekend? Texas. Okay, why? Because OU just, sucks. OU does suck. And I just think we've got the momentum going into it. Ride with Sam. Go Sam. And OU sucks. I'm going to have to go with OU sucks. <laughs> so it's what Tom's going to be. OU <laughs> sucks. That's it. That's what I'm talking about. Can you give me a reason why? Other than OU sucks. Sucks. And Vince Young coming out of retirement, he's going to play tight end. Do you think he still has years left in him? Um, we'll see. Honestly, it's up in the air at this point. Vince Young got a fourth year of eligibility. He's going to be playing tight end. Just how huge of that addition is that for Texas in this game? It's a really big addition, but like we would win regardless. We're just so good, we could have one player on the field and kick OU's ass. Uh, there's no passing. <laughs> it's always, it's actually played at a neutral site. No, I'm talking too. It's, play, it's played in Dallas, but yeah, which is Texas, but it's played like right. If you look at the reason it's played where it is, it's because it's like right in between Texas, UT. And oh, it's like oh, it's, it's, it's purely, purely neutral. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit, it's gonna be a tie. You think it's gonna be a tie? Yeah, it'll be a tie. Yeah. Tie. Yeah. <laughs> Phone, do you have a final score prediction? 
You heard it here first. Thicker, me or Sam? I am thicker. You heard it here first. You heard it here first. <laughs> you heard it here first. Coco Horns! That's cheesy. Tonight we caught up with Tom Herman at his presser to hear his reaction on Texas's loss over the weekend. The sun came up, which is always a good thing uh, for everybody in this room included. Um, so uh, our guys were eager to get back to work yesterday. Uh, good energy at practice yesterday. Uh, obviously there, there's a lot of things that um, uh, we can learn from that game and, and need to improve on. and. Um, Got a lot of guys uh, dedicated and, and committed to doing that. And, um, you know, our biggest goal, uh, we, we have completely turned the page uh, as a team. And um, our sole focus, as it should be, um, is to do everything within our power to, to beat Kansas. Moving on from the Sooners to a different Oklahoma team, the Texas women's soccer team lost their second consecutive match on Friday as they fell 2-0 to zero to the 18th ranked Oklahoma State Cowboys. With the loss, the Horns dropped to third in the Big 12 standings, but are just one point, one point beyond both Oklahoma State and Texas Tech. Texas will look to get back in their winning ways when they take on the Baylor Bay Bears this Friday in Waco. The number two ranked women's golf team won the Betsy Rawls Longhorn Invitational this weekend after shooting a program best 15 under par in the 18 hole round on Sunday. Freshman Sophie Guo led the Longhorns with a school record 8 under par 64 on Sunday. Texas finished 19 under par for the weekend for an 845 total score for the tournament and have now won the Betsy Rawls Invitational for three straight years. The 10th ranked Texas men's golf team finished tied for third in Big 12 match play this past weekend in Houston, Texas. The Horns fell to the Texas Tech Red Raiders in the final round, which caused them to compete for third place in the championship round, where Texas would go on to tie the Kansas Jayhawks. The Burnt Orange will be back in action at the Tra Tavistock Collegiate Tournament this Saturday in Lake Butler, Florida. Texas senior Bianca Taraki played in the ITF Hilton Head 25K on Tuesday against Pana Udvardi of Hungary. Despite a higher national ranking, Tarani fell to Udvardi 6-4, 6-3. Players will be back in action later this week at the ITA Texas Regional Tournament beginning on Thursday. At the ITA All-American Championships this weekend, men's tennis player Yuya Ito claimed the singles title in a 6-4, 6-4 victory. Ito, ranked number four, played number 10, ten Sam Riffis of Florida. This was the first year that senior Ito made it past the first round, and he's the second Longhorn to win the championship with the school's only other win by Chad Clark in 1993. This week in Longhorn Sports. On Friday, we have soccer at Baylor. That will be at 7 p.m. on ESPN+. Plus. Also have softball at LSU at 7 p.m. and club hockey versus Texas A&M at 9 p.m. On Saturday, we have T and F, track and field, excuse me, Arturo Barrios Invitational at College Station. Volleyball ball at West Virginia at 12 p.m. and of course that football game versus Kansas at 6 p.m. on Longhorn Nation and then finally on Sunday we have men's golf at the Tavistock Collegiate in Windermere, Florida. Thank you so much for spending your Monday, <laughs> Monday evening with us for the best sports coverage on the 40 acres. <laughs> Don't forget to watch our sister show. <laughs> <I'm so sorry. laughs> <laughs> the college crossfire on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. with our host Turner Barnes. <laughs> From all of us here in studio, Master Control. <laughs> I'm Bailey Wall, joined by Henry Corrin. Have a great night. <laughs>